Well, good evening and welcome to Vespers on this Wednesday of the 13th week after Pentecost. Thanks for being with me tonight. The scriptures we're going to be using are Psalm number 96. Uh, we're going to finish 2 Samuel chapter 14, um, and we'll continue in Acts chapter 21. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Would you please pray with me? Bless us, O God, with a reverent sense of your presence, that we may be at peace and may worship you with all our mind and spirit. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Jesus Christ is the light of the world, the light no darkness can overcome. Stay with us, Lord, for it is evening, and the day is almost over. Let your light scatter the darkness and illumine your church. Joyous light of glory of the immortal Father, heavenly, holy, blessed Jesus Christ, we have come to the setting of the sun, and we look to the evening light. We sing to God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you are worthy of being praised with pure voices forever. O Son of God, O giver of life, the universe proclaims your glory. The Lord be with you. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who led your people Israel by a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. Enlighten our darkness by the light of your Christ. May his word be a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. For you are merciful, and you love your whole creation. And we, your creatures, glorify you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Let my prayer rise before you as incense, the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. O Lord, I call to you. Come to me quickly. Hear my voice when I cry to you. Let my prayer rise before you as incense. The lifting up of my hands is the evening sacrifice. Set a watch before my mouth, O Lord, and guard the door of my lips. Let not my heart incline to any evil thing. Let me not be occupied in wickedness with evildoers. But my eyes are turned to you, Lord God. In you I take refuge. Strip me not of my life. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Let my prayer rise before you as incense, the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. Let the incense of our repentant prayer ascend before you, O Lord, and let your loving kindness descend upon us, that with purified minds we may sing your praises with the church on earth and the whole heavenly host, and may glorify you forever and ever. Amen. <laughs> Pardon me. Amen. <clears throat> Our Psalms number 96. Sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the whole earth. Sing to the Lord and bless his name. Proclaim the good news of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations and his wonders among all the peoples. For great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. He is more to be feared than all gods. As for all the gods of the nations... They are but idols, but it is the Lord who made the heavens. Oh, the majesty and magnificence of his presence. Oh, the power and splendor of his sanctuary. Ascribe to the Lord, you families of the peoples. Ascribe to the Lord honor and power. Ascribe to the Lord the honor due his name. Bring offerings and come into his courts. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Let the whole earth tremble before him. Tell it out among the nations, the Lord is king. He has made the world so firm that it cannot be moved. He will judge the peoples with equity. Let the heavens rejoice and let the earth be glad. 
Let the sea thunder and all that is in it. Let the field be joyful and all that is therein. Then shall all the trees of the wood shout for joy before the Lord when he comes, when he comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world with righteousness and the peoples with his truth. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, the incarnate word, when you consented to dwell with us, the heavens were glad and the earth rejoiced. In hope and love, we await your return. Help us to proclaim your glory to those who do not know you until the whole earth sings a new song to you and the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen. Okay, our first reading is 2 Samuel chapter 14. I'll read verses 21 through 33. Then the king said to Joab, Behold, I grant thee. Now I grant this, go, bring back the young man Absalom. And Joab fell on his face to the ground and paid homage and blessed the king. And Joab said, today your servant knows that I have found favor in your sight, my lord the king, in that the king has granted the request of his servant. So Joab arose and went to Geshur and brought Absalom to Jerusalem. And the king said, let him dwell apart in his own house. He is not to come into my presence. So Absalom lived apart in his own house and did not come into the king's presence. Now in all Israel, there was no one so much to be praised for his handsome appearance as Absalom. From the sole of his foot to the crown of his head, there was no blemish in him. And when he cut his hair, and when he cut the hair of his head, for at the end of every year he used to cut it, when it was heavy on him, he cut it. He weighed the hair of his head, 200 shekels by the king's weight. There were born to Absalom three sons and one daughter, whose name was Tamar. She was a beautiful woman. So Absalom lived two full years in Jerusalem without coming into the king's presence. Then Absalom sent for Joab to send him to the king, but Joab would not come to him. And he sent a second time, but Joab would not come. Then he said to his servants, See, Joab's field is next to mine, and he has barley there. Go and set it on fire. So Absalom's servants set the field on fire. And Joab arose and went to Absalom at his house and said to him, Why have your servants set my field on fire? Absalom answered, Joab. Behold, I sent word to you, come here, that I may send you to the king to ask, Why have I come from Geshur? It would be better for me to be there still. Now, therefore, let me go into the presence of the king, and if there is guilt in me, let him put me to death. Then Joab went to the king and told him, and he summoned Absalom. So he came to the king and bowed himself on his face to the ground before the king, and the king kissed Absalom. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. All right. So <clears throat> yesterday we had this reading with this woman that Joab sent to uh, role play and to show the king that he was, um, he needed to take action with Absalom. You know, it doesn't say whether anybody approved of Absalom killing Amnon for raping his sister or his half sister, but um, not doing anything wasn't helping. So today is the king's response, right? The king was able to tell it was Joab, right? Is the hand of Joab with you in all this? And she says, it was your servant Joab who commanded me. It was he who put all these words in the mouth of your servant, right? So the king responds. Um, the king responds, go bring back the young man, Absalom. All right. Now, that's going to say why, does it? It just says, go bring him back. So, Joab, knowing that he could have been punished for misleading the king or for tricking the king with this woman or whatever, um, he fell on his face to the ground and paid homage and blessed the king, right? 
So today your servant knows I found favor in your sight that you've granted my request, right? So Joab at least knows that the king is not, not angry with him, that the king has seen Joab's wisdom. And it was, it was wise. So he thanks the king for his grace and for um, for hearing the wisdom that Joab had, Joab had to offer. So he did what he said. He went to Kishur and brought Absalom to Jerusalem. The king says, put him in his own house. Don't let him come into my presence. All right? He was excluded then from the royal court. So there is an element of punishment here. He did, after all, commit murder. Well, it was not Absalom's role to be judge and executioner okay not to say that amnon didn't deserve death but absalom was not authorized to be the one to carry that out so there needs to be some level of punishment so he is excluded from the royal court and then we have this no one is as handsome as he is no one so much to be praised for his handsome appearance as absalom there was no blemish head to toe he cut the hair of his head. He weighed it 200 shekels. So a shekel, 11 grams, a lot of hair. Okay. Um, and there were born to him three sons and one daughter whose name was Tamar. She was a beautiful woman. Now, this is unusual because we don't get any of the male names, only... The daughter's name. Uh, it could be that they were born as or died as babies or died young. We don't know. We only have this. This is a different Tamar. She very well could have been named for Absalom's sister. That is entirely possible, um, and very likely actually. So, so he lived two years without coming into the king's presence. That is a long time. And he asks for Joab. Joab turns him down twice. So he he makes him an offer he can't refuse, right? He sets his field on fire. And apparently they weren't very subtle about it. They just did it, right? So they just said, and why did you, why did your servants set my field on fire? Right. As if he didn't know, right? This is probably a question he already knew the answer to. So this forced them to meet. And that's exactly what Absalom wanted. I sent word to you. I wanted you to send a message to the king, and here's the message, right? Why did you bring me here? It'd be better for me to back there. That's what I wanted you to say to my father, the king. So now just let me go into his presence. If there's guilt in me, then he can put me to death. So Absalom's ready for whatever the consequences are, but he is... This is a long two years and he's done. He's just not going to do this anymore. So he, so Joab went to the king and he summoned Absalom. Yes, come into my presence. So he came to the king and did what he's supposed to do. He bowed himself on his face to the ground and the king kissed Absalom. So it says here, instead of death, Absalom expected a full restoration of royal privileges so in other words he is saying this expecting exactly the opposite he expects he knows because again he believes he acted righteously so he expects that this being put to death is absolutely not going to happen that he is going to be given grace and he's going to be restored to full royal privileges so outwardly david and absalom were reconciled but their hearts remained far apart so with, with restored privileges, Absalom was now able to campaign to be king. He was going to try and take the throne from King David, right? But he has worked his way back in, and now he's going to, as we'll see in the coming day's readings, he's going to try and take the throne forcibly. So... All right, so this is a, an intricate story, and there's a lot to it, but we'll see how it plays out tomorrow. Now, let's go to Acts. 
So today we're in chapter 21, and we're going to read verses 15 to 26. After these days, we got ready and went up to Jerusalem. And some of the disciples from Caesarea went with us, bringing us to the house of Nason of Cyprus, an early disciple with whom we should lodge. When we had come to Jerusalem, the brothers received us gladly. On the following day, Paul went in with us. Two James and all the elders were present. After greeting them, he related one by one the things that God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry. And when they heard it, they glorified God. And they said to him, You see, brother, how many thousands there are among the Jews of those who have believed? They are all zealous for the law. And they have been told about you, that you teach all the Jews who are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, telling them not to circumcise their children or walk according to our customs. What then is to be done? They will certainly hear that you have come. Do therefore what we tell you. We have four men who are under a vow. Take these men and purify yourself along with them and pay their expenses so that they may shave their heads. Thus all will know that there is nothing in what they have been told about you, but that you yourself also live in observance of the law. But as for the Gentiles who have believed, we have sent a letter with our judgment that they should abstain from what has been sacrificed to idols and from blood and from what has been strangled and from sexual immorality. Then Paul took the men, whoops, oh, jeez. I lost my place. Ah. Then Paul took the men, and the next day he purified himself along with them and went into the temple, giving notice when the days of purification would be fulfilled and the offering presented for each one of them. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Okay. <clears throat> so. Yesterday's reading, um, Paul was in Caesarea, Caesarea Philippi, teaching there. Here's this prophet. Prophet comes in and tells him, you're going to be bound and delivered into the hands of the Gentiles. Most likely, most likely the Romans, because the Romans are the authority in Jerusalem. And everyone there told Paul not to go to Jerusalem. And he says, I'm not only ready to be in prison, but I, I would even die for the name of Jesus. And they they saw that he wasn't going to be persuaded, and they stopped arguing with him, and they just said, let the will of the Lord be done. And that's where he's left. So they got ready, and they went with him to Jerusalem, just as he said he was going to do. Some of the disciples from Caesarea went with. It's a, I don't know, probably a two or three days journey by foot. It's a two-hour bus ride. but <laughs> and they, And so here's this. Um, this is who, who lodged them, right? Who, who gave them uh, root, room and board while they were in Jerusalem. So uh, we come to Jerusalem, the brothers received us gladly. So this is, this is the church in Jerusalem, okay? The following day, remember, this is where the 12 are centered, right? So you've got, you know, of course, not, not Judas Iscariot anymore. You've got, um, Matthias replaced him, but you got James and the elders. And James was kind of the um uh kind of the ringleader in in Jerusalem for a while, being that he was he was uh uh Jesus' brother. So if Peter wasn't there, James was kind of he was he was definitely keeping the the fires going in Jerusalem. So all the elders were present. He greeted them. He told them all the great things he'd done among the Gentiles, right? And remember how Paul came to that because he was frustrated with some Jews um, having him arrested all the time. They were harassing him. They were chasing him from place to place. And remember, he said, I'm done with you. I am going to take the gospel to the Gentiles now. And then he pretty much turned his back on, on the, uh, on the Jews who would not hear the gospel and, their hearts were hardened. So, so they heard of all of his ministry and the and the things that God did among the Gentiles, and they glorified God. They agreed it was a good thing. Okay. But they say, 
See, brother, how many thousands there are among the Jews of those who believed. There are still a lot of Jews. Okay. This this church is for everyone. It began with the Jews and grew into with the Gentiles, and there's becoming a divide. And we had already seen that just in the 12. Peter and Paul had to be reconciled. So the Jews are all zealous for the law, right? They still, um, you know, you must be circumcised. You must eat kosher. You must do all these, all those 613 things. They believed it still had to be kept, okay? Jesus, Jesus kept the law, okay? And these Jews have been told about you that you teach all the Jews who are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, telling them not to circumcise their children or walk according to our customs. Now, that's a twisting of what Paul's actually teaching. He's saying it's not necessary. He didn't say they couldn't or they shouldn't. He did teach it wasn't necessary. It's not necessary to be circumcised in the body. It, what God wants is you to be circumcised in your heart, to enter into covenant with God in your heart, to acknowledge that God has claimed you in your heart. Okay? The circumcision was a sign of the covenant. But then is to be done. They will certainly hear that you've come. So to Jews, forsaking Moses is to no longer live in righteousness. And for Jews, living righteously is of supreme importance. So here's what we want you to do. Do therefore what we tell you. We have four men who are under a vow. <laughs> okay. So for various reasons, Jews periodically would put themselves under a vow. See Numbers chapter 6. We are not to swear in support of evil, that is to support falsehood, or to swear when there is no need or use. But we should swear for the good support and advantage of our neighbor. This is this is an excerpt from the large catechism. Okay, so um, taking a vow was a, was a relatively common practice. It was an exercise of spiritual growth of, of faith. So and the and the Jews in Jerusalem would have recognized this. So take them. And purify yourself along with them. Now, why would he have to purify himself? Because he's been with non-Jews, because he's been with Gentiles. Pay their expenses, right? Paul is to purge himself of the suspicion that he has become a traitor to the Jewish people and their customs by publicly associating himself with these men and paying this considerable expenses involved in the sacrificial ceremony of purification each one would have to sacrifice an animal. So Paul was going to pay all that so that they may shave their heads. That often came with a vow. Thus, all, all the Jews, everyone will know that there is nothing in what they've been told about you, because this is a way that you are showing your obedience to the law, but that you believed yourself and also live in observance of the law. But as for the Gentiles who have believed, We've sent a letter with our judgment that they should abstain from what has been sacrificed to idols and from blood and from what has been strangled um, and from sexual immorality. These are all things that pagans used to do. They didn't know they wouldn't have considered anything wrong with it, but God's law prohibits it. So they're trying to get them to obey the basic Ten Commandments, not necessarily get into the nitty gritty of of the 613 laws but at least the 10 commandments god commands us very early on you will not you will not eat or drink blood right well you don't the blood contains the life and that belongs to me says god um, not supposed to eat anything that's been strangled this was another you know and the food sacrificed to idols um paul writes about this extensively in his letters you know if because it might because of gentiles might get confused you know, oh, so we're still worshiping that God because that's the food that was sacrificed to that pagan God, right? So they they sent this letter out to explain, okay, you know, not all the Jewish laws are required, but here's some that we believe are still important and those we retain. So Paul took the men and he did exactly what the what the elders told him, right? Took the men, purified himself with them, went to the temple, giving notice. When the days of purification would be fulfilled, it usually took seven days. So, and the offering presented for each one of them, he was perfectly obedient. He could see, number one, he submitted himself to their authority. Number two, it, it seems that he would have 
accepted their wisdom here. And that's smart because it could have created a rift in the church. So, so he did it. So tomorrow we'll pick up there and see if it had a good effect. Let's conclude our liturgy. In many and various ways, God spoke to his people of old by the prophets. But now in these last days, he's spoken to us by his son. My soul proclaims the greatness of the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God, my Savior, for he has looked with favor on his lowly servant. From this day, all generations will call me blessed. The Almighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. He has mercy on those who fear him in every generation. He has shown the strength of his arm. He has scattered the proud in their conceit. He has cast down the mighty from their thrones and has lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he has sent away empty. He has come to the help of his servant Israel. For he has remembered his promise of mercy, the promise he made to our fathers, to Abraham and his children forever. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and will be forever. Amen. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this holy gathering, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For Bishop Dan and Dean Steve, for your servant, for Pastor Henry, Pastor Nelson, for Vicar Rebecca, for all our pastors in Christ, for all servants of the church, and for all the people, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For our public servants, for the government and those who protect us, that they may be upheld and strengthened in every good deed, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For those who work to bring peace, justice, health, and protection, in this and every place, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For those who bring offerings, those who do good works in their congregation, those who toil, those who sing, and all the people here present who await from the Lord great and abundant mercy, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For favorable weather, for an abundance of the fruits of the earth, and for peaceful times, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For our deliverance from all affliction, wrath, danger, and need, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the faithful who have gone before us and are at rest, let us give thanks to the Lord. Alleluia. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Rejoicing in the fellowship of all the saints, let us commend ourselves, one another, and our whole life to Christ our Lord. To you, O Lord. O God, from whom come all holy desires, all good counsels, and all just works. Give to us, your servants, that peace which the world cannot give, that our hearts may be set to obey your commandments. And also that we, being defended from the fear of our enemies, may live in peace and quietness through the merits of Jesus Christ, our Savior, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, God forever. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. 
Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. And now the Almighty and merciful Lord, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, bless and preserve you. Amen. And that concludes our Vespers for this Wednesday. Thank you for spending this time in the Word with me, and thank you for giving back to God a little bit of the day he's given to you. I apologize for the uh, change in schedule today. It's uh, get the newsletter out week, and we were a little behind schedule. So uh, thank you for your flexibility. Uh, we're back on track for Matins tomorrow. So I uh, hope you can join me for that. So I wish you a blessed rest of your evening and a blessed rest of your week. And until we can be together again, whenever that is, may God bless and keep you.